Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is the um, time in a normal conference where someone would be out in the hallway trying to herd everybody back into the room. Everybody would have had a good meal and uh, had good conversations around tables. Uh, but um, unfortunately, I'm still just the uh, after lunch speaker. So, uh, so that's that part hasn't hasn't changed. Um, very glad to be with you from uh, snowy Winnipeg. Uh, we've got another four or five inches today, and uh, so we're probably about fifty percent above average, um, which uh, I wish everyone across the prairies could be, but uh, that's. Um, that's where we're at out east here. So um, glad to be with you, sort of. And uh, so what I'm going to be doing today is talking a little bit about some of the short term, the medium term, and the longer term uh, things going on in our in our crop markets. Um, and talk uh, to some degree about where we're at right now, set a little bit of the groundwork and how that's changing things. Um, but also at the same time, how some of the effects of the 2021 drought are going to carry forward even a little bit longer into next year or maybe even a little further. Uh, and then there's some things further out yet that I'd like to try and tackle. Um, and those aren't necessarily related to, to the drought, but uh, some of the longer uh, term things uh, to watch for. So that's where we're that's where we're at and uh, what I'll try and get through and hopefully leave some time for questions at the end. So none of this uh, next little bit is going to be a surprise to anybody. Uh, this was the growing season, the rainfall during during last summer. And so there were a lot of places that had uh, about 70 or 25 percent less moisture. Then there's that big orange blotch in the middle where it was probably about half of normal and a good chunk of that came earlier in the year and uh, and then disappeared uh, later on in the year where the rest of the year was was um, just just brutal um, and that followed on some very dry soil conditions going into the year um, but it wasn't just the rainfall it was also the temperatures and so this map shows that uh, shows the number of days where temperatures were above 30 degrees Celsius um, and it may be hard to read the legend on the on the screen but really, there are there were a bunch of areas, especially southern uh, southern Saskatchewan, southeastern Alberta, um, but a whole lot of areas. It was just hotter than usual, and so some of those we had almost uh, so almost a month's worth of days that were above thirty degrees Celsius. So uh, it was just horrible. And 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 truth be told, I can. I can identify with this. My very first year of farming was 1988, uh, where May started off the year uh, with 30 degree temperatures and strong, strong winds. And so it was that was it was it was a similar type of a year to that. So it was the temperatures and the lack of rainfall that really did the crop in. So when we look at some yields uh, that we've that we had in 2021, and these are yield yields compared to the five-year average. So you can see that for crops, especially that are grown more in the south, things like Durham, things like mustard, uh, yields dropped by more than half of the five-year average. So yields were less than half of that. Um, but almost all crops were 30, 40 percent below the five-year average. Uh, one of the notable exceptions is sunflowers. And uh, so that's actually leading to a pretty strong interest in growing sunflowers um, this this spring. So there's there's your first one of your first spillover effects of the 2021 drought. So some just horrible yield performance. And then what that did in terms of production. So when you take acres and and you um, you put in those lower yields, uh, essentially we lost about 30 million tons from the 2020 crop. Um, and it's interesting to note, not just the drop in 2021, but that production 2013 was an extreme high, of course, um, but production has been trending pretty strongly and steadily higher aside from 2021 of course uh, and so that's a positive thing if we're if we're looking at some of the some of those kind of trends but uh, we lost roughly a little over 30 million tons from the 20 compared to 2020 now what does that do in terms of the of the western canadian economy well if we take those kind of uh, crop losses those 30 million tons uh, and we would multiply them not by this year's prices which are a good, uh, largely a result, those high prices are largely a result of the drought, 
um, what we have is, um, uh, sorry, what I use is prices from 2020. So if production had stayed unchanged and if prices had stayed unchanged, essentially, that's, that's kind of the, the assumption that goes into that. Um, but really what that does is it siphoned about $11.5 billion uh, out of the Western Canadian economy. Uh, and of course, people in your position uh, are quite familiar with that and have seen some of the impacts of that. Now, that's been distributed very unevenly because for the, for the few people that got average or close to average crops or things like that, uh, they're, doing fair, they're doing quite well. Um, but meantime, others who, who lost most or all of their crops, uh, those, those high prices really aren't, aren't helping them all that much. But it did have a big impact on crop prices. So again, these, these, um, those $11.5 billion losses um, are, are based on last year's prices, but prices have gone up. So this is a crop, these are indexes that, that actually started back in August of 2020. And so you can see that when we rolled into late summer of last year, that prices really took off again, especially for things like pulses, uh, for some of the other uh, special crops. Um, but what's also worth noting is that the market was already trending higher throughout the previous year. So in some ways, uh, this largely um, accentuated or, or exaggerated, not exaggerated, but improved those prices that were already uh, trending higher. Uh, so it's, um, there was some gains to be seen from that, obviously, um, but um, prices were already uh, looking fairly favorable um, even prior to that. So that's where some of the offset is, has occurred. And again, especially for those people who had some crops. Um, so what I want to talk about is, is now is a little bit about how those, those kind of losses or those, uh, those shocks to the system uh, have impacted things, uh, including on how farmers make some decisions. So first of all, there's a whole uh, change in the timing of sales um, and farmers trying even harder to, to pick the highs and, and and, and who can blame them? Um, when you see prices, when you see $22 Durham prices or saw past tense, I guess, uh, where you saw $45 flax prices, uh, where you saw uh, mustard at $1.50 a pound, um, just some, some record levels or things like that. Um, farmers were, um, because they didn't have much crop to sell, many of them, um, it was more critical than ever to try and maximize those prices. So there was some, some changes or there have been some changes in the timing of sales. And even now, just in the last two to three weeks, we're seeing some big, big um, shifts in how those sales are being made. And now more concern about minimizing losses as opposed to trying to maximize uh, the highs. Um, there's been a clearly a reluctance to forward contract after getting um, uh, getting hurt badly uh, for some, in, in a lot of cases uh, with having forward contracted, either not having product to deliver or even if you did, missing out on those high prices. So that has that natural response to, uh, to be uh, hesitant about uh, uh, contracting. Of course, there's big changes in cost of production calculations uh, with high prices for crops. Uh, those are being factored into those cost of production calculations. And then, of course, the input side as well, too. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, there are much higher price expectations. And, and we'll go into that a little bit more as well, too. Uh, and in some cases, those have been self-fulfilling. The fact that farmers have just not been selling um, has, has pushed those prices higher than they might have been otherwise. And so that's um, uh, that's been affecting the market as well too. Um, the weather worries for 2022 are much earlier than usual. Um, I've been getting, you know, or seeing lots of questions about uh, what crop insurance is insuring for. So what prices, their price levels they're setting for their crop insurance rates. And, and essentially what's behind those questions is the fact that um, they're worried that they're going to get a crop at all next year. They're going to put something in the ground, but now they're trying to see if they don't get a crop, what their coverage levels or what the revenue um, might end up being. Uh, and then there's all of the uh, fluctuations in the Canadian dollar, and I'll show a chart in a second about that, but that it has impacts, of course, 
uh, more favorable on import, imp, imported uh, crop inputs. Uh, but then if, it's, uh, if the dollar uh, moves back higher again, um, also tends to be negative for uh, crop prices. So it, has, it, it, it cuts both ways, essentially. Um, Josh, I'm sure, talked about this yesterday, so I, I really don't have much to add, uh, except that, that it's not just the highs in the fertilizer prices that are the issue, but it's also the volatility. And I'm sure he touched on that. I've seen him, um, uh, I'm sure I've seen him, um, or I, I know I, I saw him present a, a week or two ago uh, where he highlighted that. So, so that is a big issue. Um, in terms of the Canadian dollar, uh, there's been some extreme volatility here too. Uh, we saw since late December, we, we saw the Canadian dollar up three cents US uh, and then it dropped back uh, two cents. And even now with oil prices, crude oil prices um, at $90 or higher, uh, it really hasn't had much of an impact on the Canadian currency. And, and frequently, although not always, um, but frequently or usually, uh, those two, uh, the crude oil prices and the Canadian dollar, are quite closely correlated. So that's um, that's something that um, is interesting to watch. And and the and the usual calls for or predictions or projections for the Canadian dollar um, aren't necessarily uh, coming through. But it still has an impact on, like I said, the the crop inputs that are being imported, but then also the 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 crops that are being exported in and I get the opposite effect. Um, other impacts from the uh, from the uh, the drought still in 2021 uh, is that there's a lot more intense acreage competition uh, this year. Uh, there's there's very, very short supplies of almost every crop. I, I can think of maybe maybe rye is one that isn't, uh, but there, almost every crop is in short supply. Um, and, and bids right now, new crop bids are at the highest level they've ever been at for this time of year. Uh, so farmers have opportunities to forward contract at very high prices. But again, they're cautious. Uh, they're, they're nervous about that because A, they might not have a crop or B, if there is a, is a problem with the crop, prices could go back up. Uh, even higher than these new crop levels again. So they're understandably very hesitant to do that. Um, the other thing that I've seen this year is it seems there's other variables. Uh, there's, there's always a whole mix of variables, um, but some of these are even more prominent than usual. So things like seed cost have become more prominent because as crop prices go up, seed costs go up as well too. Uh, even seed supply, again, tight supplies of, of crops uh, and, uh, and pedigreed seed, uh, supplies as well too, uh, and that varies uh, considerably. Fertilizer costs. Um, I don't know that I've seen Josh uh, present nearly as much at conferences as he has this year because there's so much question about that. Uh, still, things about uh, disease. There's more uh, looking at drought tolerance. So, which crops performed better last year? Um, herbicide resistance. That's always an issue. Herbicide carryover. So because of the dry soil, how are those going to affect uh, crop rotations uh, in 2022? And product availability of uh, crop protection products, of fertilizer, of seed even, and, and so on. Um, another impact, another large impact is that some trade patterns and market share have been shifting, which is normal if we don't have the crop to grow or to, to export, uh, that's gonna change those. And we'll look at a couple of examples of that. Um, and then buyer's behavior, they've become much more hand to mouth. Um, although we've seen with some crops, and I was just looking at some export data for, um, for both canary seed and mustard, is that they, they really stocked up early and now they've really become quiet. And so, so there are very diff, uh, some changeable, some, some noticeable changes in, in export or importers uh, behavior uh, toward purchases and when they purchase and so on. Um, just to highlight some of the things related to new crop bids, uh, these are Western Canadian canola bids. Uh, and so the brown line are spot bids or currently if they're delivering right now. And then the yellow line is for fall delivery of canola. And, and at this point of the year, we've never had canola prices. We've, we've never had, frankly, we've never, Prior to last year, we've never had eighteen, nineteen dollar canola. We're we're way at a we're at a, a, a at record levels uh, 
even um, even aside from that. So we're, we're at these record prices right now um, and record possibilities for locking in. So there's lots of farmers nervously, do I price, do, do I not, how much do I price, um, and so on. So there's a whole lot of that uh, decision-making uh, and, and questions, unknowns going on right now. Um, other things, this is, this is a, um, something I ran a, a little while ago, um, but because seed costs have gone up, crop prices have gone up, and so especially for things, well, for both pedigreed and common seed, um, those prices have, seed prices have gone up uh, considerably. So how much of the seed cost um, uh, is, or how much of the, the total input cost is made up of seed uh, versus other inputs uh, and so on. And so things like some of the pulses, of course, it's a higher percentage of their, their total uh, input uh, basket. Uh, soybeans as, as well would be in there. Um, canola seed costs are, are high, as uh, not surprisingly, um, but it's a lower amount of the, of the total uh, input cost for canola. Uh, we also ran some, some uh, variable costs. Uh, so that would be seed, chem, uh, sorry, seed, crop protection, fertilizer, and I think crop insurance in there as well too. Uh, and then some, this was based on prices uh, a few weeks ago. So granted, it's a little bit dated, um, but, um, but what we see is that there's some, some potential for extremely high revenue per acre based on those prices uh, and even based on uh, some some uh, a little more subdued kind of yields, some very high revenue per acre possibilities, uh, but also some some much higher um, uh, variable costs. So there's more risk. There's more potential reward as well too. So there's um, there's a lot of interesting dynamics going into this this spring's planting decisions. Uh, so when I look at, when I again ran those numbers and then I started to stack them up, these are for the dark brown soil zone. Um, and so you see that generally it's some of the, some of the special crops, the pulses, uh, flax, canary, uh, that are uh, looking better than others. Now, truth be told that this doesn't tell the whole story. We don't build our, our acreage forecasts just based on, um, on these gross margins because we know there's as I said earlier, there's a whole set of factors that go into um, farmers making the decisions. And to a large degree, farmers are um, fairly committed to their rotations, to their crop rotations. And so there's, there's some um, uh, wiggle room, I suppose, in some of, the, some of the crops, but to a large degree, they're not gonna push their rotations uh, too far out of the whack, especially because of things like, um, uh, all of those agronomic factors that go into crop rotations, they're not prepared to put those at risk um, either. So, and th but this uh, still shows that there's some more incentive toward uh, some of those special crops. Um, there's, as I said, there's some changes to trade patterns. So these are the things even before this last year, uh, canola prices or canola supplies in Canada were so tight that uh, Ukrainian rapeseed even came into Eastern Canada earlier in 2021. Uh, and then more recently, some barley, uh, some malt barley from, uh, I think it was Denmark uh, or France um, was, was again being brought into Eastern Canada. So these are kind of things that are just unheard of. Uh, and there's been a whole lot more of them. I'll, I'll show you a couple of, the, couple of other examples. Um, because the drought, the 2021 drought wasn't just Western Canada, it affected a good chunk of uh, Montana, North Dakota, which is where in the U.S. they grow a whole the whole set of crops or a good set of the crops uh, that are, are grown in Western Canada as well. Um, there's been a whole move in, uh, or there were some severe crop losses there as well too. So that's where they tend to grow more. U.S. tends to grow more of their peas. So uh, this chart shows their exports, their monthly exports um, in the blue bars, and then their imports. Um, and so what you see is they imported over 80,000 tons of, um, of peas in November. And that included 20, bringing in 20,000 tons of peas from Ukraine. And from what I understand, there's going to be more of that to come in the months ahead. So again, when you think about impacts or spillover effects of the drought, uh, these 
trade patterns, shifting trade patterns are part of that. Um, we Canada has lost market share in a number of crops. So these are Russian mustard exports uh, this year, the, the black line with the yellow dots. That's the current year. So Russia has really stepped in uh, to fill the gap in uh, caused by the big losses to the Canadian mustard crop. Um, and so one of my questions is, as I look at this, um, will those shifts become more permanent? Um, and there's some suggestion that, that yes, indeed, once um, European or Asian uh, buyers of mustard, for example, um, are have become more adapted to Russian mustard. Um, they're not going to flip back to Canadian uh, mustard quite as quickly or in the same volumes as they did before. So that's the that's the worry or the concern uh, after a year like this. So some of the things that uh, short-term factors that are going on in the markets right now, um, and so these I highlight a few of those, is one of them is weather in South America, the, the soybean crop in particular, uh, is in the mid of, midst of being harvested in Brazil, um, but there's still, as you go further south into Argentina, Paraguay, Argentina, uh, the crop is still uh, vulnerable or susceptible to, the we to weather developments. Um, and the crop estimates for soybeans and for corn in South America uh, are continuing to be downgraded. And so that's what's been causing some of the, some of the move, uh, moves, overall moves in corn and soybean futures lately. Uh, the other thing, another thing to watch is the winter wheat crop in the US and Black Sea as it comes out of dormancy uh, later a little bit in March and forward. Uh, the Black Sea, well, and in Europe as well, too, the crop is looking decent. But in the U.S., there are threats uh, to the, especially to the hard red winter crop in west of the Mississippi. Um, spring moisture in Western Canada and the northern U.S., of course, that's a, that's a huge one for us. Uh, and lots of concerns about that. Um, things about input costs and whether those can still influence some acres. Uh, there's geopolitical situations in Ukraine, uh, in China that also are adding to the, the uh, touchiness or, or edginess or nervousness um, in markets. And so that's causing some of the volatility that we see in the, net, in the, last, in the last little while. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some acreage shifts and some yield prospects uh, and whatnot, uh, just to give you a bit of a picture of that. Um, so uh, these are some projections that we've made uh, for the 2022 uh, crop. So spring wheat, we're calling uh, down slightly. So lose about a half million acres of uh, spring wheat, and uh, but also pick up a little bit more uh, from in Durham. So there might be a little bit of a, a switch over in those areas where uh, those either of those wheat classes can be grown. Uh, winter wheat is already down a little bit. We already know that based on a StatsCan survey. Um, when we look at some of the uh, coarse grains, uh, corn, uh, roughly steady. Um, oats, we're expecting to be up uh, two, 300,000 uh, tons, or uh, sorry, acres. Um, barley is probably gonna be one of the ones that will take some of the larger hit. Um, and some of that is related to, um, particularly in Saskatchewan, um, that it performed poorly under dry conditions last year. So that's already discouraging uh, some of that. And again, fall rye, that's already in the ground. So acreage of that is roughly steady. In terms of oil seeds, again, $25 new crop bids for flax, we think should buy a few more acres, although there's always reluctance <laughs> to grow flax these days. And, and some people view it as more of a nuisance, even at $25. Um, or the old or the the old crop bids that had hit forty five dollars at one point. Uh, canola we're expecting to get just shy of twenty three million acres, which would be very close to an old record from oh I can't remember the year now, but about six or seven years ago. Um, so very close to an old record. Uh, soybeans down more again because of poor performance in in the drought uh, last year. Uh, in terms of pulses, probably see a rebound in chickpeas. Uh, dry beans might actually pick up a little bit. Um, both lentils and peas should improve a little bit, although there are some questions too about all kinds of things related this, with lentils, for example, uh, with herbicide residues, 
uh, that could um, that could affect uh, those uh, those kind of um, acres. So um, so there's still still in flux there. And then the other minor crops, um, sunflowers probably will go up more than that based on what we're hearing lately and the interest in growing the crop. Uh, canary up uh, 35 cent new crop bids uh, are looking pretty favorable and mustard at um, I believe 70 or 75 cents for, for yellow new crop bids um, we think should buy some acres, although seed supplies will be a, an issue. Uh, so those are some of our acreage projections. Uh, for the for the year, but here's one of the other things that we're looking at. Of course, is uh, this this chart or this slide shows the soil the drought monitor as of the end of January, uh, 2022. Uh, so just a few weeks ago, as compared to a year ago. So last year we already thought it was dry in good parts of Western Canada. This year it's an even bigger concern. So. As I said, that's a huge factor that's sitting in the back of the farmers' decision making, in the back of their minds as they make decisions uh, for the uh, coming year. And so, not a surprise that they would be asking for uh, what are what are the crop insurance uh, uh, prices, what are the crop insurance rates that I can I can lock in at. Now, so this is one map, but then if I, it's it's very interesting to not get too hung up on one map because uh, this is also this is from agriculture and ag food canada so this is percent of normal soil moisture again as of the end of january and based on this it shows that yes there are some some pretty dry areas still in western canada but it's not nearly as dire as um, as some have suggest or that that the previous map uh, would suggest um, and so uh, you know, truth be told, it's you don't want to be taking any of these as as gospel truth. Um, but um, but but there are some differences of opinion. And then, of course, uh, you get into spring and you get into March and April uh, and you either get or don't get um, some some decent uh, spring rains. And that can change the outlook um, massively as well, too. But when we when we look at previous years and and so here's a this is just an example these are this are these are wheat yields over the long haul in western canada so for non durham wheat and so if there are two analog years for 2021 they would be 88 1988 and would be 2001 um, and and what you see is that when you have those severe kind of market or sort of severe kind of yield hits, um, it takes a year or maybe even two years uh, to really recover back up to the to the average or or trend yields, um, if you will. And and so when we're looking at this year, if if there is any anything we can take from history, uh, it's that the yields uh, for 2022, the odds are that they will be below average again. And so uh, my partner, John, and I are already building that into our, into our forecast for next year uh, or for, the, for 2022 crops um, by, um, by looking at the five-year average, which now includes the, 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 the very poor yields in 2021, and then even shaving a little bit off of that yet as well too. So for example, our forecast um, or, or the last few years for, um, for non-Durham wheat yields were close to 55 bushels an acre. And then of course we dropped to 40 in 2021. Um, and so our forecast now is struggling to get back up to 50, let alone the old average of 55. So those are the kind of things that we're already trying to factor in as we look ahead to uh, the 2022 crop. So if you take those kind of yields, and as I showed earlier, a small drop in a non-Durham wheat um, acres, uh, what you get is that this is non-Durham wheat supplies. And so you have your carrying over less, um, but that the crop isn't going to recover or rebound as much as maybe we would expect if we had average yields. So this is just an example. This is one example, but if we were to, if I were to pop up slides of other crops, um, you'd see a similar type of a thing uh, for something like canola, where you have uh, more of an acreage increase or oats. Uh, you'll see a bit more of a response, but that supplies in general of crops are are not going to get not going to make a full recovery in one year. 
And so what that is, is friendly for prices, uh, at least from a Western Canadian perspective. Um, of course, there's a whole rest of the globe uh, that has things going on too. But for the, for the crops that are also grown in Montana, North Dakota, they're very dry there as well too. Western North Dakota, especially uh, very dry there as well too. So to expect um, lentil uh, production or, or flax production or some of those crops where you're growing them in those same regions uh, to recover, um, you, you have to be pretty optimistic to, to get to those kind of levels. So we're trying to be, to, to use some of the numbers, use some history to guide that as, as we go forward. Looking at some of the medium term uh, developments, if there are things that can carry forward from 2021, and then oh, there's, a, there's a number of other things me going on medium term as well too. So we're gonna take a look at some of those uh, in a little more detail, but in general, you have a higher price, higher cost environment. So as I said before, farmers price expectations and end users pricing are in some cases are already getting locked in. Um, and so, when you've seen, if you've looked at a bag of oatmeal these days or, or a package of pasta or a number of other things, um, you're seeing those higher prices already. The question is whether, even if we have some better crops next year, um, are, th are those prices baked in already? So, so are, we, are we, I guess I'm trying to say, is, are, we, are we establishing a new higher price environment? Uh, and I'll show you a slide in a second that I'll talk about that. Um, then there's a whole thing about domestic processing. And we'll, again, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But what that means is you get more stable and you also get more aggressive pricing. You also get stronger competition for acres. So from a farmer perspective, those are, those are very good things. And uh, so that's why that's mostly viewed in, in a positive light. Uh, and then there's things like consumer trends, there's plant proteins and, and um, I guess in Canada, you're not allowed to call them uh, milk, uh, but, but these beverages that are white and uh, are, look like milk, um, those types of things, uh, generally less meat consumption, especially in red meats. And then there's, you always know, got these people who are ready to eat bugs um, to save the planet. Um, so, so those are some, a few of the consumer trends that are going on. Uh, but but here's the question, for example, about oat uh, or about the, you know, whether we're in a new environment or a new uh, price plateau. And I'm hesitant to talk about new paradigms or new era, eras. Uh, that uh, goes a little bit against my grain. But I think there is something to that. And, and so this shows um, oat bids over the long haul, going back to the early 90s. Um, and it just shows this year how how this year stacks up against every other year. Um, so it's just been a massive change. Um, but you see a, 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 a gradual change in these floor prices, whereas in the 90s, uh, the floor price was about a dollar a bushel. Then the floor where farmers would stop selling or stop growing oats, it moved up to a buck fifty, and then, and then even in the last years, there was a floor around a dollar, around two dollars. But where is that new floor going to be? Is it going to be three dollars? Is it uh, is it going to be four dollars? I I don't know that we can a floor can be that much above that. But but we we can be establishing these new floors where farmers either don't sell or don't grow oats uh, if prices drop uh, below. Uh, those levels. Uh, so it discourages production, keeps prices um, artificially, not artificially, keeps prices supported. Um, here's the thing about food, a little couple of comments about uh, food inflation. So um, I don't know that all of these increases are transitory, that they're, you know, if we get oats dropping back to three or four dollars or something like that, whether the bag of oatmeal on the shelf is going to drop by that same amount or same proportion. Um, but uh, but it also we have the luxury here in in Canada, for example, uh, of being able to most people anyway of being able to absorb those higher prices. It hurts, but um, it's more in other parts of the world where you can really um, uh, do some damage and hurt people. Um, here's a slide. Uh, now we're talking a little bit more about uh, processing. So this is oat. Uh, uh, exports of Canadian oat products. So rolled oats and steel cut and oat, uh, well, whatever kind of other kind of uh, cuts or, or mills you can do of oats. Um, and it's interesting to see that we've added 
considerable capacity, especially in the last, or again, in the last few years. Um, and so this is truly a success story that doesn't get much press. Um, but you see in 2021 um, that we exported um, nearly, well, 950,000 tons of, of oat products, um, and that would have continued in 2020 or in the year we're in right now, if there had been available oat supplies. Um, but really, Canadian oat millers uh, have been outbidding uh, US buyers considerably. So that's when I talk about how domestic processing provides better prices for farmers. Um, that's especially been the case this year, where there have been shortages and uh, Canadian millers have just been um, have been have been showing much stronger prices to farmers than U.S. buyers have. So that's a success story. Uh, again, not that it gets much not that it gets much play. Of course, the big one that does get play is is are the all these announcements about canola crush capacity. So uh, these are just a couple of the a couple of the slides uh, expansions in Yorkton, um, a, a biofuel bi uh, renewable diesel. Um, uh, facility uh, around Regina. It seems that Regina is the hot spot for uh, for building new crush capacity, and and I don't know whether all of them are going to get built. Uh, none of these are um, um, these announcements are coming from kind of um, unknowns in the market. Uh, all of them have pretty deep pockets, so it's going to be difficult to say. Um, if anybody will blink in this kind of them, some of it may get pushed back a little bit. Um, that those are some possibilities, uh, but but really uh, this has the this has the potential to seriously change um, a whole bunch of things, and not just for canola. So we'll uh, talk about that a little bit. So this is uh, if you fast forward based on the announcements and when they say they'll be operational, um, is that we could be crushing. 17 million tons of canola um, by, uh, well, that would be two, three years from now. And you can see how that stacks up against where we've been till now. Uh, and again, we took a hit in this year and in probably again in next year because of low canola supplies. But our largest crop, canola crop ever, was 21 and a half million tons. And now we have announcements that would mean 17 million tons of uh, canola crush capacity. Um, so that has a whole lot of implications. And again, not just for uh, canola. So what does it do? Well, it puts huge pressure on canola rotations. Um, so um, I've been working in this business since the early 90s. And, and I remember even then when canola uh, when people were talking about growing 15 million acres of canola and well, that's not going to happen. That's just not possible. Uh, and then they would build more canola crush capacity, two plants being built in Yorkton and wow, that's, that's overbuilt. And, and, and clearly those kind of predictions, uh, some of them, my own um, were, <laughs> were um, uh, wrong. Um, and so you have those kind of things. And so it's hard to see a path forward in terms of, uh, canola acreage and yields uh, and some of those kind of things. Um, partly too, because that's a, as I showed you in the previous chart, that's a huge change in very few years. So we don't have the, the luxury of adding 10 or 20% uh, to our canola yields every year. Uh, canola yield improvements are more gradual than that. But again, uh, it adds stronger, steadier demand, like I was telling you about with the oats, uh, more competition, better basis levels. Uh, there's going to be a whole lot more trucking of canola seed within Western Canada, uh, moving it to these various plants. Uh, you'll also need more rail. You'll need to move a whole lot more oil and meal. Um, and a lot of that will, almost all of that meal will get exported. Right now, we're only using 11 or 12% of the meal domestically, canola meal domestically. Uh, so those kind of, that, those are going to be challenges. Um, and the oil, some of it, more of it will get consumed domestically, uh, in, especially for renewable diesel and, um, and if there's biodiesel still being uh, produced. Uh, so some of that will remain within Western Canada, but um, um, we have, we'll have less seed going to port. Um, and, and again, if suddenly we're 
uh, out of a, if we're, if we're crushing 6 million tons more, that's 6 million tons less seed going to port. Um, so that has a whole bunch of uh, spillover effects as well, too. There's going to be more intense acreage competition uh, with canola uh, leading that charge. Um, and, and my guess is that some of the minor crops uh, that have already been losing acreage over time um, are going to lose even more. So uh, we could lose some diversity of crops um, in that whole situation. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of spillover effects of canola if if Canadian canola stays within our borders, uh, where else will production expand? So that could be places like Ukraine, could be places like uh, even uh, more areas within the US. Um, Australian canola could, could expand as well too. Uh, so other countries aren't just gonna sit still uh, while Canada uh, chews through more of, its, uh, more of its own canola. So those are a bunch of ripple effects that I see coming as a result of that uh, increase in crush capacity. Uh, and whether it's all of those plants or even two thirds, three quarters of them, um, it, those, those effects are still gonna be there. Um, here's another one uh, that we're looking at a little bit and we've seen a lot of uh, buzz of course about it is um, using peas in and other other pulses uh, in food products. Uh, this shows uh, usage of peas within Canada and the US over the last number of years. So generally it's been trending higher. Now this includes feed use. Uh, we're not able to pull to separate out feed use from uh, domestic processing we're working on trying to sort some of that out, but right now we're not able to do that. So in this year, 21, 22, uh, feed use is probably like a, a smaller a chunk of that total, but we're probably at record uh, domestic use of peas. And again, uh, that's, that's um, a favorable situation because largely it was the US buyers that were bidding $18 for, for yellow peas earlier this year. Um, they're the ones that were bidding most aggressively um, to get peas. So that type of demand is, is the best type of demand in terms of, uh, in terms of prices uh, and is less variable. So you're less likely to get sideswiped by geopolitics or events in other parts of the world, uh, production, uh, so on and so on. Um, so then there are a number of other developing issues. There are within Western Canada, there are these production constraints. So we'd like to be able to produce more of everything. We'd like to have more acres of everything, more yields of everything, um, but that's just not possible. And, and so it's who, who are, or which crops are going to be the winners, which ones are going to be the losers in that. And so um, with all of the research and the big dollars um, going into canola and, and some of these other um, and some you know, movement in oats and, and peas. Uh, in my mind, it's the ones where the domestic processing is, is strong and building up uh, where, where those will be more of the winners. Um, there are competing objectives. And so we've had in the past, although they seem to be getting less of a less airplay these days, is you had um, every one of the, uh, the grower associations talking about objectives for um, production by such and such a date. Uh, and so again, they can't all, they can't all be achieved. Uh, there are constraints in the system. There's sustainability issues. Uh, there's agronomic constraints, which seem to be only multiplying uh, as, we, as we go forward and rotation limitations. Um, other things that are going on with this year of extremely high prices, uh, food security is a higher issue a higher priority for a whole bunch of countries. Talk about that in a little bit. But it's brought on things like um, export taxes, for example, from Russia, um, production subsidies or um, minimum, minimum price uh, guarantees to their own farmers in some of these countries, uh, uh, restrictions in fertilizer exports. And uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm not an expert in that, but, but those are some of the things. Uh, and then there's China, which I'll talk about in more detail yet. Uh, taking what I would call proactive steps um, to to nail down supplies uh, and um, and diversify their um, their origins for a number of crops. So here's an example of uh, how some crops, uh, as I was saying, there are constraints in our system, and so how some crops are 
getting pushed to the sidelines. So flax is an example of that. Mustard would be another one. Uh, maybe there's, uh, there might be a few others as well too, but this one seemed fairly graphic. So the red bars in this chart are total, are global exports of flax. Uh, so that, that market has been growing. And yet at the same time, Canadian share of that, which used to be, uh, we used to dominate that market, um, but now we're down below 30%. Uh, in terms of um, a market of Canadian share of the market. So Russia and Kazakhstan uh, have largely taken over that market. Uh, this last year, Kazakhstan grew uh, at least two and a half million acres of flax. Lousy yields this year, but two and a half million acres of flax. Whereas we're now struggling to get a million acres uh, of flax. So, so that's how that, that market has shifted. Um, you can see too exactly when the big drop in this thing happened was 2010, which is where Trifid became an issue and, and kind of set us on our heels. But that change was already happening prior to that. So Canada was already becoming less dominant uh, prior to that. And, and that trend has just continued. And so that's one of my concerns about uh, some of these, uh, this, this, um, uh, uh, competition for acres and competition for production in Western Canada. Uh, sustainability. So all kinds of groups are talking about sustainability issues now, and and, and you know, and for good reason. Uh, but these all um, tend to be um, or to have the potential to to constrain production. And I know they're trying to work with um, uh, work without that being a um, uh, being a real um, uh, or really constraining. And I'm not an agronomist, so this is far outside of my, my area of expertise. Um, but it will at least uh, tap the brakes, if you will, on some of the uh, hoped for production increases or the, the increases that are needed uh, to keep those markets uh, well supplied. So um, those, are, those are constraints, if you want to call them, uh, on the system. Um, there are, of course, always rotational considerations. So will we be able to grow the number of acres of canola? Uh, yes, we're going to increase yields, but are we going to be able to grow the acres of canola that are needed to do that? Uh, things in pulses. Um, I think we're without um, some, some breakthroughs in terms of plant breeding. Uh, we may be getting close to that, that ceiling in, on, on pulse acreage in Western Canada. Um, so what does that do? Does that push more acres into other countries uh, to keep the to keep China satisfied or to keep um, uh, Turkey or India satisfied? Um, we don't, those are some, those are again, uh, some constraints on the system. Um, and then we have, as I said earlier, we have uh, countries more concerned about uh, food security. And so this is an example of um, uh, India, India's pulses. So this is total pulse production uh, or pulse acreage, I should say. Um, and so they've really been pushing hard to boost um, area. This goes up to 2020. Uh, and so if you take the last five years on the chart on the right, uh, and you take the 10 years prior to that, uh, they've added almost 10 million hectares. That's 25 million acres of pulses. Uh, over the last 10 years. So there are some, some real um, steps and initiatives being taken. And it includes minimum support prices. It includes uh, input subsidies. It includes uh, import restrictions. It includes all kinds of things to try and um, uh, support their domestic production, support their farmers uh, in doing that. So that's, that's just one example. Um, if we look at China in a little more detail, uh, what you have is these are some statements from their last five year plan. So food security is a matter of national fortune and is the top priority of governing the country. Uh, their goals are to build, renovate, upgrade storage facilities to 680 million tons, which, which, is, which is massive. I know China has a billion two uh, people. I'm not sure what the latest number is, um, but those are still massive numbers of storage. Uh, sign uh, agreements in more than 60 countries uh, to, uh, to ease that flow of uh, products, uh, crops, uh, food products coming into the country. Uh, and then lastly, increasing crop yields 
uh, with things like gene editing um, and GMOs uh, and and uh, increasing technology to do that. So some huge steps being taken in China as well too. Now we can argue about how successful they will be, but clearly it is uh, a direction that they're moving in. So the headlines, these are some couple of headlines that they're trying to move toward more oil seed self-sufficiency. So canola, um, but more so soybeans. Um, they are increasing approvals of uh, GM corn and soybean varieties. And so these are all things that they're doing to try and um, increase their um, food security or improve their food security. Um, they're also trying to diversify trade. So this chart at the, on the bottom left there are flax imports. Um, and so you used to see in, the, in 2019 and even you see a transition happening, uh, whereas Canada had a large chunk of that flax import market. And even before we had the crop failure of 2021, they were already moving into taking more flax from Kazakhstan, uh, taking more flax from Russia. And then, of course, now with the drop in Canadian uh, crop and sky high prices here, uh, almost all of their flax has been coming from Russia. So they're no longer dependent on Canada. Uh, they just announced a, um, a deal with Russia to improve uh, or to drop import restrictions, phytosanitary restrictions on Russian wheat and barley. That has a big uh, potential as well too. But there's also politics involved. This shows their uh, this shows their um, uh, barley imports over the last number of years. And they, they used to import most of their barley from Australia. Of course, they got into a dispute with Australia. And now you see in the last year that they've imported exactly zero tons from Australia. Meanwhile, they've boosted imports hugely. So Canada has benefited, uh, in the case of barley, has, in, has benefited from this. Um, but there's always um, an element of... Um, arbitrariness. I'm not sure if that's the right word or if that's a word at all, um, but there's, it's, it's hard to nail those kind of things down. So there's a, um, uh, some difficulty in trying to forecast um, those types of things. Um, of course, you've probably seen maps of their Belt and Road Initiative that reaches uh, west into um, Asia and then into the former Soviet Union and all the way into Western Europe. And then there's all kinds of maritime things as well, too. Uh, I need to move through here a little more quickly uh, to make sure I have some time for questions. Um, but um, Kazakhstan and, and Russia in particular are big parts of that. Uh, Africa as well, too. Uh, huge investments being made there. Um, but it's all an effort to try to diversify origins. Uh, so not being as wholly dependent on other on certain countries as they were in the past. Uh, and then there's a few longer term thoughts that I just want to touch on that go beyond just the next couple of years. But there is vulnerability of industries that are built on government mandates or programs. So biofuel policies, they can be very helpful for, for prices and for farmers and so on. Um, but um, again, those aren't the most stable of things. There's, there's always the threat of changes in those. Um, and then there's, you know, who are the, who's the, who's the most environmentally um, friendly uh, groups out there? Um, and, and how are those, how do those, how do those moves or those trends or those um, programs um, move over time? Uh, energy markets are highly unpredictable. There's all kinds of factors going on in there. Uh, and they have big, big impacts on input costs, but also uh, where grain flows due to freight advantages um, and, and so on. Um, there's other things related to sustainability uh, directives, uh, things coming out of, the Euro out of the EU in particular, or our particular interest slash concern, um, but they tend to add costs and lower production. At least that's the way they're, they, they're, the initial response to them seems to be. Uh, and then there's this potential for creating two tiers of global markets. So you have these sustainable markets where things are high cost, high price, but then you have a whole nother set uh, of uh, markets where it's just put out the maximum amount of production at the lowest cost per unit um, and so we could see some, some more splits developing in that. And so that'll be interesting to watch going forward. Uh, there's pressure, pressure from climate directives. Um, what happens, for example, if, if these vehicle, electric vehicle targets are 
are entrenched and moved, uh, you know, whatever the, the deadline is, the 2030, 2035, or whatever those are, uh, what happens to that whole biofuel industry uh, if suddenly everybody's driving Priuses or, well, no, not even Priuses? What happens to those, what happens to those industries and then all of the downstream uh, from those? Um, there's, in, you know, things related to meat consumption and, and so on and so on. It, you know, is the, is the meat tax lobby going to beat out the regenerative ag lobby or how's that going to play out? And I don't have answers for that, but they're things to watch. Um, here's another one. I've, I read this book not long ago called Empty Planet. It's written by a couple of Canadians. Um, but, but essentially what they're doing is they're, they're actually looking at all kinds of demographic trends in not only developed countries, but in developing countries and are suggesting that essentially that, that the, the global population is going to peak much earlier than some of the forecasts and then will actually start declining. So what if we're continuing to increase global uh, crop production, ag production, uh, and population starts declining? Uh, and you could say, well, incomes will go up, so it changes the mix. Absolutely, that's possible. Um, but it's not something that you want to, it's, it's a very interesting book to read, uh, I found anyway, uh, and kind of challenges some of those, those baked in ideas that we've had. So that brings me to the shameless plug from left field. Um, uh, I was given uh, permission from, from CAR to do this. And in fact, it's a bit of a partnership. Um, but this in the last year, we've launched a farm market letter. And so it's a, it's a weekly newsletter that comes out talking about crop markets. Uh, and we cover 16 different crops. Um, and it takes our, our full newsletter stuff and boils it down uh, considerably. Uh, and so it's geared toward farmers. Uh, and so what we'd like to do is for CAR members is to offer an opportunity uh, to provide these uh, newsletters uh, to your client base or a segment of your client base um, at, a, um, at a substantially reduced price. And so that would let you build value uh, with those customers, provide uh, uh, help broaden the relationship, and maybe show some differentiated offering. Um, and, and it also provides an opportunity, a tangible, uh, if there's a weekly newsletter going out with reminders of specials that you may have or notices, events, news, those kind of things. Um, it's an, it's a, an excuse um, to be, uh, frankly, emailing with your clients. Uh, your customers every week. Um, so that's something that we'd, we'd like you to um, um, like you to consider. Um, and uh, we'd love to talk to you about that. Um, how it would work is essentially would be a co-branded um, farm market letter um, with a tailored message that can go in a weekly email. Uh, we would manage distribution so you wouldn't have to deal with all of that, or we'd figure out something else depending on how you want to do that. So again, shameless plug, um, but um, you can contact us uh, for details about that. So uh, I hope, oh boy, I, I really haven't left a whole lot of time for, for questions, um, but um, willing to do that. Uh, there's our contact information if you want, even if you have questions about the presentation afterward, you can contact us. Um, but um, uh, I think I might have time for questions. I have one here that um, was, uh, came in early, I guess, um, and it said, what percent of 2021 crop was unpriced post-harvest? Um, well, um, I'm not exactly sure of the amount, but what I would say is that the, the percent dropped sharply as the crop uh, contracted. So we often see that, you know, maybe 30, 40 percent of the crop is contracted um, ahead of time before harvest. But as that crop shrunk by 40 percent, um, suddenly it's, it's looking more like a 40, 50 percent plus um, of the of the um, of the harvest was already forward contracted, and so lots of buyouts, lots of difficulty with dealing with that, lots of regrets about having contracted, um, and then um, percent of 2022 crop forward contracted versus average uh, year to date. Um, I would suggest that that's probably. Um, I would probably say that we're at this point anyway um, less than 20 percent. Uh, in spite of some very attractive uh, new crop bids uh, being out there. So, um, so anyway, so that's, uh, that's one question that came in. I don't, uh, I'm not seeing other ones coming in uh, at this point. Um, 
So I think with that, unless there's unless there's another question that comes no, in. No, I think I think we're all good, Chuck. I think it's. Uh, I have to be honest. I think your presentation was quite thorough, so I think you answered <laughs> any of the questions as they came up. So it's all good. Well, thorough is a good word for it. Okay, so I'll. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I'm glad to talk to any of you afterward if you uh, you have the email and you know about the presentation about our offer, whatever. And uh, again, thank you uh, so much for the opportunity um, to speak with you. So I will um, I will leave it at that.